Welcome to video number two for the Jacksonville Community Colel's Pre-Pesach series. Here we're going to start talking about koshering our kitchen. Before we get to the technical aspect, let me give a little bit of background of just kosher in general, the idea, some of the ideology behind it, and specifically about Pesach, because although in general, you know, there's the stay away from pig and don't mix milk and meat and, you know, different seafood that we can't eat, you know, on Pesach, we take a whole new level where we even get rid of things that would normally be kosher, like, for example, bread. You can't have bread, the beloved Shabbos challah can't have it. And in fact, we take it at one notch up. It's not only prohibited, you can't even have a tiny, minuscule amount. So before we talk about the technicals, let's get into some of the ideology behind it. A person might want to ask themselves, man, cosuring a kitchen is a lot of work. I just, besides the fact that you had to heat up multiple pots of water, and you took all of your towels to clean up the mess because boy, was it messy. You're gonna ask yourself, why bother? There's a very deep and meaningful concept behind kosher in general, similar to a mixed drink. You're gonna say, what? what does kosher have to do with a mixed drink? Sometimes when you have a drink and you like your drink made a certain way, shaken, not stirred. Makes a big difference. But let's say somebody puts in the wrong ingredient. They put in a little too much lemon. Ugh. It gives you that face. Kashas is the same thing. Is we all have a neshama, we have a soul. And just like we have to take care of our physical body to make sure that it's healthy, happy, physically well, you gotta make sure to eat the right things and you have to make sure to make not be active enough and keep, keep moving and not just be sitting all the time. So to our neshama, our soul, we have to make sure that we have the right diet. And sometimes certain foods it just, it just doesn't sit well with the neshama. And we can't necessarily even tell that it affects us. But in, the spiritual, in spirituality, it's there. It has a big effect. And by Pesach, we have an added added level is stringency because the Torah dictates that we have to make sure that we don't have chametz. Chametz is leavening. For whatever reason, the Torah tells us from HaKadosh Baruch Hu that this is what we have to take care of during this time. There are many parables. A very uh, common one that they discuss is really the, the Yetzirah, that the chametz is like the evil inclination. And that for a, a week of the year, or eight days in, outside of Israel, we have to make sure that we have to refocus and we have to learn how to purge ourselves even of the smallest amount. And now we're gonna talk about kashering your kitchen. We're gonna focus on the stovetop, oven, sink, and countertops. If you follow this process, then you will be able to have a kosher Passover, but this is not only specifically for Passover, this is the way one would kosher all for any issue that one would have. Let's say somebody by accidentally uh, made a vessel, uh, you know, they put some milk in a meat, in a meat cup or in, a, in, a, in their sink that was in the meat, the meat sink, whoops. So then this, it would follow basically the exact same rules. We're going to try to be as clear as possible. If anybody has any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We can always be reached at office at jacksonvillecoal.com. Or if you want, there's some great references on the CRC of Chicago's website or the OU. Let's start with the sink. The most important is number one, leave it unused for 24 hours. Two, make sure that it is clean before you leave it unused. For 24 hours and three is pour the hot water over every single surface so you see the stainless steel sink that's what we want now what you see in this sink is things in the sink that's a big no-no right we don't want anything in the sink so before we are going to kosher anything we have to make sure that the sink is totally clean and it's unused for 24 hours for hot also make sure these and any strainers that one has, replace. You cannot use those over, uh, over Pesach, get new ones. So you wanna take those out as well, don't have them in there. And then you wanna make sure that the water goes over every single surface like this, you see? And then that, what you don't wanna do is 
like that. That's a no-no. If you do that, then it doesn't work halachically. You have to have it a straight flow like this over the entire surface, including this part if you have a double sink. And again, be careful. Try to get every single part of the sink. Now, we're going to start talking about the um, faucet here. Now, again, most of the time, you, you, get, you just got to make sure that it's clean, right? Obviously, your handle needs to be cleaned. All the parts need to be clean. Now, there are certain parts, obviously, that get in contact. So like this, for example, if you have an aerator, you should replace the aerator. And then make sure, if you want to, again, just pour the hot water over this area because again, this area is very likely, especially, you know, for people cooking in the kitchen, sometimes you can get a little close with, with any of your chametz materials and some of the steam can get in it. Uh, best is to replace it. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the countertop. Now, please come look over here. Is this many times is what countertops look like. This is a big no-no. If you want to cashier your countertop, you cannot have anything on it. In fact, it has to be perfectly spotless clean. This is a perfect example. Nothing should be on your countertop. You want to make sure that it's clean. Now, as I said with sinks, it's extremely important, especially with countertops, because there are many different kinds of countertops. The no first question that one has to ask is, what material is your countertop made of? Because there are many different kinds of materials. Many of them cannot be kosher for Pesach or ever. So you really have to find out what material your countertop is made of. And you have to ask your rabbi to find out how he rules about what is okay to kosher and what is not okay to kosher. But now that we know that, right? I, I don't know what this is, but I assume that it's granite. Let's say it's assume it's some sort of stone that can be kosher. And that's what this is. So now... Very similar to the sink, you have to make sure it's clean. Try to feel it, because if you just look at it, sometimes you will totally miss stuff that is stuck on really good. You want to feel it, make sure that there's nothing on there. This is, this is pretty clean. There's not much on, maybe a little dust. Oh, see? Right there. You wouldn't have even noticed unless I felt it, right? So you have to make sure that it's clean. Now, once it is clean, this can be very messy. So suggestion, have lots of towels handy. So what you do is, again, you have your hot water handy. We're going to skip heating the water. And then you pour it onto the surface in a similar way to the sink. That you want to make sure that the water actually touches all of the different surfaces. Now, what you have to be careful of is also, you sometimes have backsplashes like this. Not this, because this you're probably not going to touch. But this right here, where some food can sometimes be, you also want to make sure that this is clean. Now, there are different, right, so you might want to pour it over like this, right, just get a little bit of like that, right, and then eventually, obviously, you will uh, clean it. You want to make sure that the water is hot, very, very hot boiling while you are doing it. Sometimes what some people do, especially with something like this, very convenient that you can do this, is you leave it connected to the base while it's going, and then you really have it boiling uh, as you're pouring. Some people have different customs about kashering and covering, so do whatever your rabbi or custom is. Again, many people kasher their sink counters and leave them uncovered, and many people kasher their counters and still cover them. And some people, and this is what one would have to do if you are not able to kasher your counter, is to just cover the counter. So if you are going to cover the counter, same concept. You want to make sure that every single possible area that food can touch, that it would then be used, is totally, totally covered. So now we're at the next part of the, the kitchen, the oven. Now, first question, again, is you have to know what kind of oven you have. Some ovens have a self-clean cycle. So we're going to talk first, first about a self-cleaning oven. You see here? Self-clean. So if you have a self-clean now... I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a lots of different kinds of technologies of self-clean. We are not necessarily talk. We are not talking about a steam self-cleaning oven. We're talking about a high temperature self-cleaning oven. That means that the oven gets to somewhere around eight to nine hundred degrees inside. There's a locking mechanism. So again, one has to really know what kind of oven they have. But if we do have a self-clean oven with a high temperature, it's a pretty simple process. You put it on self-clean. So you press the button, 
and bingo. You let the self clean go and it is totally clean. Now, what one has to be careful is in an oven, you have something called racks. These racks also need to be in the oven and they need to be self cleaned as well because this, as everybody knows who cooks in the oven, there's spillages, the stuff gets all over the racks, they need to be cleaned as well and therefore they should be in the oven for the self clean cycle. Now, if you don't have a self clean oven, for example, like myself, so then, really what one has to do is multi-step process. First, is the inside of the oven needs to be clean. I highly suggest some sort of easy off or something of the, that sort. You have an oven cleaners. These are extremely powerful chemicals and it makes it extremely easy. Follow the directions on the bottle and you, if you do that, then c taking off all of the grease and gunk and whatever is on the oven really does not take that long. You just, again, you just have to follow the instructions. So you spray it all over the inside of the oven, get it on the racks, get it on the sides and back, the bottom, the door. You want to make sure to get all surface areas possible clean, 100% clean. Once it is clean, then you have to leave the oven unused for 24 hours. And once you do that, then you turn it on, you press the bake button or knob, whatever you have, and turn it up to its highest possible temperature, right? So in this oven, let's see what it would be. You just keep holding it until it cannot go anymore. 550. So once you get it to the highest, the highest temperature, you leave it on for one hour. Now we're going to talk about the stovetop. There can be many questions that come up. So it, again, First question you have to know is what kind of stovetop do you have? For example, this one, if you see, you have metal coils, right? And you have catch trays. All of these are different pieces, right? You have your coils, your catch tray, right? All of these things. In my kitchen, for example, in my house, I have a glass, a glass stovetop that's different, right? But basically, the, the cashering process is pretty similar. You have to first make sure that it's clean. This is a pretty good example of a pre very clean surface. Again, you always want to try to feel it because like sometimes it, you know, escapes the, escapes the vision, but your, your fingers, you can really sense if there's something there or not. It's very use useful to use to check whether it's clean. Now, once it's clean, also just keep in mind is you also, and sometimes when you have food on a stovetop, it can splatter on the backsplash over here, and also with ovens like this, there's a vent right around here. There can be sometimes things over here. So you really wanna make sure that this area is clean also, and this is totally clean as well. For, this, for the burners themselves, that's the easiest part. You turn it on as high as you can, and leave it for 30 minutes. Now the CRC says for coils like this, since they're exposed, you can leave them for 15 minutes. For hidden coils, like in a glass stovetop, you leave them on for 30 minutes. And for an exposed coils, like this, uh, with this stove, you leave them on for 15 minutes. And for a flame, you would also leave it on for 30 minutes to the highest. With the flame, you, with a, with a stovetop with a flame, you also have to be careful because it has that extra piece where you place the pot on top of. Many people want to kosher that with, uh, in, a, in a boiling pot of water. Again, you really got to make sure that it's actually clean. Uh, otherwise, the koshering won't, won't really help you. Now, once you've done that koshering of the coils itself, in this one, for example, it's very important, just as a point, when you are cleaning, this, this kind of looks dirty. I'm not sure if it's tarnish or dirt, but you really want to make sure that this is also clean. And then after you want to cut, you want to cover it as much with, you know, tin foil or something like that. And it won't burn out just from my own practical experience, having made this mistake, just be careful where you're putting the tin foil. If you put the tin foil where it's going to touch the coils, sometimes the tin foil actually melds to the coils and uh, eventually it'll melt and it'll burn away. But just, uh, just be careful with that. Um, so you want to cover this with tin foil and you want to really cover, you want to really cover any area that is not uh, the coil itself. So you wanna cover this area in between the burners. You wanna cover the catch tray that we spoke about. You wanna cover the knobs, the back. Obviously, you know, if you need to press the button, so you wanna, you wanna know where the buttons are. It's just the idea for that is to use like a marker on the top of the tin foil. You can just write, you know, the names and just stick it on top. But that, you wanna really cover as much area as possible that theoretically any food could touch, splatter on, um, 
etc. And there you have it. We have c covered the major bases in the kitchen from the oven, stove top, countertop, and sink. And if you kosher this, you can have a kosher Pesach. Today we are going to be looking at friends that we don't invite to the Pesach Seder.